let's continue on with the example from yesterday. I just want to uh, maybe just give a little bit of context here. It may seem like a, a, a messy example. There's nonlinear equations, three equations, three unknowns, uh, nonlinear. Why did we go to all this trouble and solve it? This is not an American at this course, and so on and so on. Uh, let's be realistic. The reason for me doing this is because all the equations in membranes are of this type, right? So ultrafiltration, microfiltration, and then the section on reverse osmosis that we're going to start next, all have this situation where our equations are nonlinear and we have to solve for multiple unknowns for multiple equations. So we're not just doing this because it's a nice application of, of solving and guess and check. It's, it's really all, all membrane design equations end up coming down to some form of iterative solving solution for that. Okay? So it's a, good, it's a good opportunity to practice some of the stuff you've learned in your prior courses, but it's also necessary for um, all of separation systems to form this, uh, follow this type of approach. Another example of where this comes up a lot is in distillation part of design. There's, there's a lot of this iterative um, equation solving that goes on. So we had ended off the class yesterday by setting up the equation system after identifying our three unknowns. So if we come back to just the first module, we can look at solving the first module, and once we have that set, then solving the second module is, is just a repeat of the first okay. So let's just focus on the first module where we have our feed of known conditions coming in, known flow and concentration. We're given the area, A1. So that's a key, key point over here. We're told that we're purchasing these in units of 30 meters squared. We just have one membrane up here. So A1 is known as well. CP1, the permeate concentration is also known. That's zero. That's a standard assumption. So we're solving for the three unknowns in the boxes over there. For the second situation, though, um, it does tell us the desired solute concentration is 20 kilograms per meter cubed. Yeah, we're uh, for part two. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, we're focusing here on part one and on the first membrane. Okay, so we're going to come. I'm going to talk about the second part next. So still on part one over here, we're saying for a given membrane of 30 meters squared up here, and another membrane of 30 meters squared at A2, what is the concentrations of this intermediate stream and then the concentration of that final stream here? So we set up the three equations there. There was the a balance on. The, the standard is our equations will always have a volume balance. So volume balance gets me that Q0 is equal to QP1 plus QR1. I can also do a solute mass balance. That says Q0, C0. And omitting the permeate stream out, I can just drop uh, the permeate stream out because that's going to have zero solute leaving. Um, that's equal to the QR1, CR1. So that's my second equation. And then my third equation is the um, given to me by the membrane company will give this to me, or I will determine this equation based on some simple experimentation that the flux QP1 divided by the area Sorry, not the flux. QP1, the volumetric flow divided by the area, that's equal to the flux, is equal to, in this case, um, let's just leave the symbolic HW, the mass transfer coefficient, times log of C at the wall divided by C in the retentate CR wall. So we're always given, or always have those three equations to work with when we're solving the system. And we showed yesterday how you might do that to calculate the final um, values leaving here. So we ended off by, by putting them up here. CP1 is 0. QP1, that volumetric flow, is 0 0.846 meters cubed per hour. The retentate flow is 1.65. And CR1, that concentration was 6.1 meters and check for 6.1 kilograms per meter cube. So once we have CR1 from our guess and check procedure yesterday, we could back calculate QR1 and QP1.
Now you have those values and you can go cascade it down to the next unit in the series and repeat the same operation. So I'll just put the final answers there for you to go through on your own time. So same approach and you'll find that QP1 is a smaller volumetric flow rate. That's not surprising because coming in here um, we have the same membrane module. Membrane module 2 is the same design and shape and size as membrane module 1 but we're feeding the second membrane with a smaller flow rate, 1.65, as opposed to 2.5. So all the flows will scale down. So QP2 is 0.587, CP2 is 0 as before. QR2 is equal to 1.06. This QP hour and CR2 is equal to 9.4. So we've, we've upgraded, notice here our membrane has upgraded the solute. We've gone from 4 kilograms per meter cubed over to 6. And then our second membrane is taken from 6 to 9.4. We've strengthened that concentration now. Now, the moment we have guess and check, we always look for bounds within which we can guess our answer. So, re recall yesterday we said that CR1, when we guess that initial value, we know that it cannot be higher than the wall concentration of 25, and it's got to be higher than 4. So, that gave us bounds in which to work with. When we do our next iteration, we know that CR2, which we're trying to solve for, we don't know that yet. That's going to be higher than the feed, 6.1, but also again lower than 25. <coughs> so my bounds for the second unit change up like that. I will also show you a neat little trick to save you a lot of time on getting that first initial guess. It doesn't work for the first membrane, but for the second and subsequent membranes, a good approximation that one can use is the following. that CR1 divided by CR0, so what's leaving divided by the feed, so leaving and retentate divided by the feed. That ratio of what's leaving from the first membrane divided by what's coming in is approximately the same as what's leaving in the second one divided by what's coming in at the first one. Okay. So this is a really good way because remember, when we come to repeat the calculations on the second membrane, we have to do guess and check again. Okay. We're guessing and checking for CR2 in our <coughs> second membrane. So that equation over there gives me a, a very good initial guess for CR2. Pretty much it gives you such a good guess if you only need to do one iteration. That first guess that you get will be pretty much accurate. But it's not 100% it's not true to say this ratio, but it holds to a good approximation. So on the, our second go at this, we will already know C0, we will know CR1, and we can calculate CR2 as our, as our check. Everyone comfortable? Yeah. Sorry, so isn't it after uh, a desired slight concentration of 40? No, no. That was the previous question. Oh, so we didn't take that part of it. Okay. So we don't know the after concentration. We're just simply buying one module of 30 meters squared, putting it in series with another module of 30 meters squared. It's like, what is going to come out at the end? We don't know. That's what the RNA was here. So you help it CO2, in fact. Yeah. Is that assumption only good if the yeah, they must be the same, yeah. Okay, now let's change the problem up a little bit. And this next part says, what if we would like leaving that second membrane, CR2, to be a certain value? Okay. 
CO2. So now I'm going to specify CO2. So CO2 is going to be given to me. And this time I'd like to calculate A1 and A2 to get that CO2. So let me take a look. I'm going to mark them in boxes what my unknowns are. So my unknowns as before are <coughs> So I know my feed conditions. Now I don't know what A1 is. I have to figure out what A1 should be. I don't know QP1. I know CP1 is going to be zero. I don't know what this intermediate stream is going to be. I'm going to specify CR2, so I'm going to give that. I don't know what QR2 is going to be. And I don't know QP2. And A2. And so I now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven unknowns. Give you a minute to take that down to redraw the diagram to the notes. So we've got seven unknowns. <coughs> and a good piece of advice for you to know for the rest of your career, whenever we say find the optimal, optimum, as you know, as you will figure out for those of you taking 4G, which means that there's some sort of optimization problem going on. There's an optimum. What is the optimal area? In this case, what would optimum mean? Maximize, minimize, minimize. So capital costs are going to be proportional to area in some way. The more membranes you buy, the more area you have. You want to minimize that cost, minimize the area, find the lowest area possible for A1 and A2 to achieve a certain objective. Here's the thinking and the reasoning behind it. It's fairly intuitive. If we buy a small membrane here and put that in the first unit, so A1 is really small, then our, we're not going to get a big upgrade in the retentate concentration. The retentate is going to be changed very little from what comes in at the feed versus its lead for a small membrane area. So then our second membrane is going to be, have to be really big in order to do the work so that we can get to this desired CO2. This is what we want. So if my first membrane is small, my second membrane has to be big to get to that CO2. Conversely, if I put a really big membrane up front, then I just need a smaller one at the end to tidy up and clean to get this CO2. Or, what you uh, probably all immediately thinking is, well, why buy two? Why don't you just buy one big membrane and do it all in one go? Okay. So we did that calculation in the previous class, and we figured out we needed, I think it was 15 membranes in parallel to do that. Now, what you will find is that if you go to two in a, in a row, the area from the first plus the area from the second will be less than just buying one big membrane of one area. So this is not something that you can do by hand, though. This is something that you have to do by guess and check. So you go to your computer, you set up an Excel spreadsheet, and you say, I'm going to buy one membrane of 30 meters squared and put it over there. And the moment you've done that, how many unknowns have you got? You've gone from seven down to six. Because if you specify A1, you now have six unknowns. And you can then go solve the system. Because think of it, we always have six equations. We always have these three equations over here for every membrane. So three equations per membrane. Two in series means I have six equations. So I have to have six unknowns. At the moment, I have seven unknowns, so I cannot solve the system. The moment I specify one of my variables, I can go ahead and solve it. So, Guess and check approach for the second question, you'll do this in the assignment, is set A1 equal to 30 meters squared, calculate QP1, CR1, QR1, and then A2. So what is the second membrane's area going to need to be to make up 
that purification to get to CO2. We calculate A2. Then you go change A1 to 60 meters squared. You have to buy these in multiples of 30. So 30 meters squared, 60, 90, 120, so forth. So buy, put two modules here now in parallel in that first block, and then calculate what A2 is. Put three, and then calculate the A2. Put four, and so on. And what you will find is that you get a curve that looks like that. So the sum of your areas will, you need a really high area, and it will dip down to some minimum, and then peak back up. Okay, so you'll find the optimal combination of A1 plus A2 will cost you less money overall than buying just one big unit. This is why membranes are non-trivial in terms of deciding on the flow sheets, right? If it was so simple, we would just put one, all, all of them in parallel. <coughs> but if you look at any membrane purification flow sheet for a company, there's a parallel and series combinations. So, so this is why. It's, there's trade-offs between putting them in series and parallel. So take a look at that. It's a, it's a, a very straightforward exercise. Guess and check, but setting up the spreadsheet the first time is takes a little bit of work, but then once you've got, got it done, uh, you can copy and paste the formulas. Um, for that second problem, can't you assume that the two memories are the same area? Or do they have to be different to achieve that final CR2? Right, so the, the purpose is to see, like this one's going to be 30 meters squared, and we don't know what CO we know CR2 needs to be a certain amount. In the previous problem, yeah, but you're setting A1 to be 30. Yeah. What if you have the two of them, a certain number that you don't know, but you equate the two for the same area? Okay, so yeah, that could be one way of doing it, but that's not necessarily going to be the minimum cost. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I, I see, see what you're thinking there. Yeah, so you're like, well, find what A is, and then double that, and it will get you the CR2. Yeah, but that, that sum of them is not going to be the optimal. Yeah. So I think you Okay, sure. So what are we plotting over here is you're going to plot. Okay, uh, visualize this. Let me have show you this spreadsheet here. So that, that's what you're going to end up getting. And I've plotted the, the sum on that, and here I've plotted oh the recent states. Oh, right. Okay, so. Let's go back here. So you're plotting the sum of the areas. So 30, I'm going to pick 30 meters squared over here, and then I'm going to find what that area is. That area is going to be, let's say, 200 meters squared. So 30 plus 200 is equal to some number. Then I'm going to say, well, make this 60 meters squared. So if this is a bigger membrane now, I don't need 200 meters squared there anymore. I'm going to need less. Well, how much less that you don't help it? You don't find that it's maybe 150. So now you've got 30 plus 150, that's equal to 180. So your, your area has dropped. So what I was plotting here is A1 size. So I'm going from 30, 60, 90 to 100. And here I'm plotting A1 plus A2. And I want to find the combination of areas that gets me the minimum. So give that, give that one a try. Uh, working through that, you're going to be, and setting up that equation system, you're going to be very comfortable with this by the end of that. Let's just also quickly talk about fouling because the whole the whole section on ultrafiltration is hinged on the fact that we've got this gelling occurring at that membrane surface. So JP is equal to this mass transfer coefficient times the log of C wall divided by C bulk. Okay. So that gel forming up against the wall is our critical parameter that's hindering us and reducing our flux. Let's take a look at how we might reduce that wall buildup. So if we can reduce that concentration at the wall, we can get better mass transfer, we can get better flux through the membrane. So here's a list of some neat things that I've found uh, while reading all the membrane literature, different approaches people have tried. And there's, like, you, you won't apply all of these in every institute, apply some of them. So let's take a look. The first major step that you can take is 
and you'll see this in reverse osmosis as well, is you clean up your feed to minimize any particulates in there that will clog up your membrane. So as much as you possibly can, centrifuge out, or filter out on a, pre, on a prior step um, some of the larger molecular size material. Some of the other things that you can do is you can increase your pH or decrease your pH depending on the molecule that you have. And by adjusting the pH, you'll keep that molecule in solution, so in the liquid phase rather than from precipitating out. So certain salts and ions will precipitate out under different pH environments. So if you can adjust the pH in a prior step, you can keep that salt in solution and it will pass through the membrane and not clog it up. So these might be extra salts that are coming with. These are not salts that you're interested in removing. These are just salts that happen to exist in the feed stream as a contaminant. So we will see that on wastewater flow sheets. There will always be a pre-treatment pre step where you adjust pH um, in, any, in any salt water reverse osmosis uh, flow sheets will see a pH adjustment. You can back flush. Obviously, we've seen that before to clean out your pores for the membrane. You can use a pulsating feed. So you use a pump that will deliver, <coughs> that will fluctuate up and down, and that pulsation through the membrane will clear away some of the solid buildup at the wall. So that's kind of like back flushing to some extent in that you're creating this movement through the, uh, uh, in the membrane area to, to kind of take the stuff away away from the wall. You can add these inserts. Um, in fact, one of the previous membrane geometries we saw was this uh, plate and frame press where we intentionally added a path that moves the fluid through this sort of tortuous path to keep the solids off the wall. So that's the same principle um, as shown in this diagram that I have over here, where you manipulate the flow so that you create eddies and vortexes to keep the material off the wall. Some other membrane companies will add a sort of air stream injection into your fluid. So in your feed, you bubble air or oxygen or some inert gas. Now the key is when you do this is to use an inert gas. It will not react with any of the salts. So some salts dissolved in the liquid phase will oxidize and precipitate out in the presence of oxygen. So in that case, what those companies will do is they'll use nitrogen. So switch to a gas that will not interact with the material you're treating. Um, this is an, an interesting one. It is using a very rapidly oscillating electrical field. So certain molecules, like uh, uh, biomolecules, they will react and orient themselves to an electrical field. So if you enclose your membrane in an electrical field, you can os oscillate it very, very rapidly and keep those molecules moving and buzzing around so that they don't go against the wall. So that's a really interesting one, and that's patented and used in a variety of processes. But the reality is that at some point you will get buildup at the wall, and you have to resort to a, a full chemical clean, and that's what we do over here. So we flush with water, you um, recirculate with a chlorine or a cleaning agent of some sort, you rinse that agent off, you may uh, sterilize here with chlorine again, um, or this cleaning agent may be a soap of some sort, and then you sterilize that with chlorine, and then you flush to remove that. So it's a lengthy, lengthy downtime. But then once you've done all of this, you can effectively get back close to original um, fluxes as when you bought them. Okay, so many options there to deal with power. So in general, in general fouling is three <laughs> minutes before the process to stop the data. If you can pre-treat your food in a prior unit operation, that's certainly the most desirable. If your membrane is expensive to clean up when it's clogged up. Um, unless you're doing some of these, like so if the clogging is such that you can eliminate it with cheap <coughs> compressed air, um, so instead of oxygen and nitrogen, you can use air and free sparge it in there, then of course go for that. Um, that's a cheaper option. But in general, you'll always see a preliminary step on the flow sheet to clean up the feed. Okay, also last time I said that, oh, I tried to explain spiral uh, around membranes, but this uh, video is really far going to do a far better job than I can possibly do. So this is the 
using hydronautics automated casting equipment. We begin the process with a fabric support base and then coat it with a microporous polysulfone layer. This provides additional support for the top 0.2 micron thick membrane barrier layer. This top barrier layer makes the actual separation to purify the water. The semi-permeable polyamide layer consists of a thin film of polymeric material a few thousand angstroms thick formed on a porous supporting material. The semi-permeable membrane skin is formed on the polysulfone substrate by interfacial polymerization of monomers containing amine and carboxylic acid chloride functional groups. Hydronautics manufacturing procedure enables independent optimization of the distinct properties of the membrane support and salt rejecting skin. The combination of these three layers makes a durable membrane flat sheet that is used in each spiral wound element. The membrane flat sheet is then combined with a sheet of feed channel spacer. This provides turbulence and creates space between the membrane sheets to allow uniform flow of the water to the entire membrane surface. The leaves of membrane and feed channel spacer are then combined with a sheet of permeate spacer which provides open flow channels for the permeate even under high pressure. The leaves are glued along each of the three exposed sides and then rolled around the core tube. With the back of the membrane completely sealed to the edges of the permeate spacer, the feed water is forced through the feed channel spacer, contacting the front or barrier layer of the membrane. Clean water, or permeate, passes through the membrane surface into the permeate channel and then flows in a spiral direction to the center of the element and is collected into the core tube. Hydronautic spiral wound elements can then be loaded into pressure vessels and interconnected with additional elements to complete any number of design specifications. Once the end adapter is connected to the last element and the pressure vessel is sealed, feed water can be introduced and then treated. The feed water that does not permeate through the membrane becomes enriched in salts as it travels through the feed channel spacer due to permeate water being removed. Typically, 8-10% to 10 of the water is removed in one 40-inch long membrane element. The permeate water then flows out the end of the vessel and is collected as the product. And the reject or concentrate from that vessel may then flow through another vessel producing more permeate. The remaining concentrate may then be disposed of as waste or partially recycled as the feed. Typically, 70 to 90 percent of the water can be recovered as pure product water. Okay, so that's an instance where they were interested in the permeates um rather than the retentate. So different, different uh, flow sheets configuration. So what we're going to look at next is reverse osmosis, where we really are interested in the permeate more than the retentate. So as shown in the video, they, they were interested in that volume of the, of the water available at the end that you can recover and then reuse. Reverse osmosis is a mechanism that allows that to occur, right? So we use this so much. I think the, the last statistic I saw is that there's about 25,000 reverse osmosis plants in the world at the moment. Right? So a huge number of facilities that use reverse osmosis for water treatment. Uh, it's a name and a term that you've seen a lot that came up on when we at the start of the term and we're looking at different units to study. One of the ones we requested the most. So, so very, uh, very widely known. So let's take a look at the mechanism of reverse osmosis and understand what it's doing first. That's our first goal, and then we'll look at some applications and modeling and equations for it. So osmosis is the Greek word for push, and osmosis, let's look at osmosis first, and then we'll look at reverse osmosis after. Osmosis is nature's mechanism for equalizing uneven concentrations. So consider a situation where we've got a membrane, so it's a semi-permeable membrane that allows the solute 
the liquid phase, the solute stays, the solvent, to allow the liquid phase, the solvent, to move through the membrane. Okay, so membrane here is a very loose term. It's something that we've manufactured synthetically, but membranes also are cell, like cells and cellular material plants consist of, of a combination of membranes. So this appears in nature as well. So if we have a division here where we're only allowing the liquid phase, the solvent, to pass through, what will happen is consider the following situation. Semipermeable membrane, I've got a high concentration C of salts dissolved in that water. So there's no solid phase here. That's the key distinction with reverse osmosis. No solid phase. Here we're removing dissolved salts that are in the solvent. So I've got salt dissolved into water, seawater at a high concentration. Here I've got pure water, no salts at all. My permeable concentration there is zero. Nature does not like this imbalance in concentration and will work at equalizing it. Okay, so there's a driving force immediately set up by this imbalance. So my driving force is to neutralize that difference. So the, the desired endpoint would be that the concentrations here would be the same. But this is a semi-permeable membrane. It's not going to allow the salts to move. Okay, so the salt dissolved in the seawater ideally would like to come over to this side to neutralize that, to get the concentrations equal. But this membrane does not allow the salt dissolved in the liquid phase to move through. It only allows solvent. So solvent can move both ways. So if the salt cannot move, the solvent will. So the water will move to this direction to cause this to dilute. So nature will pull this in through here to cause that to dilute. But you can see what's going to happen. As that gets pulled in, the level on this side is going to rise. So water will move from the left to the right, decreasing the concentration. The moment that the water on the right increases in height, we now have a pressure difference. This movement of fluid, the solvent, through the membrane in either direction will keep occurring until that height over there is what's called the osmotic pressure. We will reach what's called osmotic equilibrium. The system is not in total equilibrium. Obviously, total equilibrium would mean that everything is, is matching, but we have an imbalance in pressure over here. But that imbalance in pressure is counteracted exactly by the desire to neutralize these concentrations. So we've neutralized this concentration here as much as we can to the point where we've raised that level and that height difference, we can go and measure that height difference, that amount is the value we can record in Pascals as the head of fluid or the height of fluid. So that height difference then is given or is proportional to we call from the fluid flow rho g h. So on Earth, we know g, we know h, we can go measure it, we know density over here. So that's that pressure difference or head of fluid, whatever you wish to call it. That pressure value over there on the left hand side is the osmotic pressure for this system. Now, let's take a look at reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis says, Let's go add even more water still to this side, or sorry, greater seawater. Now I've got a higher pressure on this side. This pressure on the right exceeds the osmotic pressure. And solvent will flow this way. <coughs> solvent will flow to the left. The water will flow out to the left. And because this barrier of membrane is semi-permeable and only allows the solvent to flow through, the solute will be retained on the right hand side. So that's reverse osmosis. I'm reversing the natural osmosis due to the system. Okay. What you can see here immediately is the tremendous amount of energy we have to overcome. We have to overcome nature's natural osmotic pressure 
So nature, there's, a, there's this delta P due to the osmotic pressure. We're going to have to push higher than that, overcome that first to reverse the natural osmotic direction. So that's the terminology reverse osmosis. Okay. Everyone clear on that physical principle? Any questions? Go from this side to this side. So initially they have the, <coughs> the same pressure on both sides. At the moment, that there's atmospheric there and atmospheric there above both sides. Well, like, or they're equal, right? Oh, like, so the first slide? Yeah. yeah. So they have both the same pressure. Yeah, so, so I, I do I have important to split the pressure. No, I, this is just as I start. So I pour equal amounts of liquid in. The moment I let that rest, give it some time to come to equilibrium, and then get that. So with a bit of time, this will naturally go up. We're going to calculate right now how much that's going to go up. It's a huge amount. You, you, it, it's, a, it's a surprising large amount. Does it have to be open to the atmosphere? Yeah, we're, yeah, equilibrium. So both sides, yeah. But it, like, it has to be? No, it doesn't have to be. But as long as both sides are at the same pressure, then osmotic pressure will be the difference. We're interested in the difference. The membrane? Yeah, so the membrane in, in all those slides was the same kind of membrane. So now <coughs> only the solute to, uh, sorry, the solvents to pass. The solvent passes, the solute is retained. <coughs> now, what's really interesting about the osmotic pressure is that it's not a function at all of the membrane. Osmotic pressure is purely a thermodynamic property. You can predict the osmotic pressure, and we will do so right now, without any knowledge of the type of membrane you're dealing with. Okay? So the, if I change my membrane, the osmotic pressure does not change. Osmotic pressure is a function of the, the temperature, the concentration of my seawater here. If I change this water for ethanol, then osmotic pressure changes. But if I change the membrane, Osmotic pressure for the same fluids at the same concentrations is not a function of the membrane at all. It's only a function of the, the system I'm dealing with. Okay, so that's why we call it a semi permeable membrane. We allow the solvent to pass with the solute. We will assume initially it will barely pass through the membrane. Okay, what we will talk about and relax that assumption is we recognize that a bit of solvent, sorry, a bit of solute will pass through the membrane, so I'll take that assumption away later on. But initially, it's a good first approximation to assume that nothing permeates. But realistically, uh, we do expect some of the, these molecules. Because think of what the semi-permeable membrane is doing. This membrane has pore sizes that are so small that we're retaining NaCl in solution. So if it's salt as an NaCl that we to, that <coughs> membrane is so small that it those pores do not allow that dissolved ion to pass through, but it allows H2O to pass through. So we're right down at the molecular level um, in terms of these pore sizes when you're talking about semiconductor. So osmosis is also the principle why uh, trees and so forth can grow to the very tall heights that they need. Um, it's incorrect to say that it's a tree, uh, filler reaction that pulls water up a tree. If you've learned that in school, that's false. It is osmosis that's doing that. Uh, capillary reaction you can show on Earth will only go as high as 10 meters. And trees go taller than 10 meters. So we know that it's not capillary reaction. It's osmosis that pulls up the water through to the, to the leaves. Um, so as evaporation occurs there, the salts get more and more concentrated in the top of the leaves. We now have an imbalance in, solute, in salts. So nature sends more water up to the trees, leaves. Okay? So osmosis is the mechanism by which trees pull water up from the soil into their leaves. Um, if you've thrown salt onto snails and slugs, they die. Why is that? What's the principle happening? If you go back to this diagram. Water in their body. You're pulling the water out of their body. Right? So the snails body is a membrane, and you're pulling the water out of it, you're dehydrating the animal. So um, same reason if you put a freshwater fish into salt water, 
they'll die. So pretty gruesome examples of osmosis here. <laughs> but you get the message, right? If you want to try something a little less drastic, you can put potatoes in water at home and put one potato, uh, cut it up into the same size, put one cube in water, put one in salt water. What's going to happen to the one that you put in salt water? Shrink or swell? Okay, give it a try. So, um, so this is the principle of osmosis, and reverse osmosis says let's exceed what nature is doing. We apply a greater pressure, overcome osmosis, and we'll force water through the other way. So our driving force then is the pressure we apply minus osmosis. So we have to overcome osmosis, so the net driving force is our delta P minus osmosis. So uh, this is going to be my net driving force. Okay, so we're going to see this in our equations coming next. We're going to have to apply a pressure that exceeds the osmotic pressure of the system in order for reverse osmosis to occur. If we apply a pressure that only matches osmosis, we're not going to get any transfer through that membrane. We have to go beyond that level. We have to counteract nature. So actually, we it's the systems that have very high osmotic pressure are going to be really hard to work with and care about. Sorry, the tree was reverse osmosis? The tree is osmosis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here yeah, we can calculate uh, osmotic pressure. Yeah. Sorry, osmotic pressure. Yeah, osmotic pressure. So yeah, osmotic pressure. Or pressure due to osmosis. Okay. So let's take a look at how we can calculate what that osmotic pressure is. Remember, it's a function only of the system. It's not a function of the membrane. So this equation up here will not have any terms in it that rely on knowledge of the membrane. So the osmotic pressure pi, standard notation for it in the literature, is equal to something that looks like the ideal gas law, but it's not, um, because it's also for liquids. It's the number of moles of ions so if I've got Na and Cl, I have one mole of Na and I have another mole of Cl available. So two moles of that salt, if I'm the <coughs> sodium chloride, times this gas law constant, R, that we're going to use it in, in slightly different units that you're used to, because again, for convention in this area, temperature in Kelvin divided by the volume of the solvent associated with the solvent. By that I mean, if we take salt and dissolve it into water, I'm referring to this volume of water that the salt is dissolved in. So the volume there. Or another way of seeing that is N divided by V, moles per meter cubed. That's a concentration, moles per meter cubed in C, um, and times by T. So take a minute and calculate and prove to yourself that one teaspoon of salt dissolved in a liter of water. So this is a tiny amount of salt. A teaspoon in a liter of water gets an osmotic pressure of five times the atmospheric pressure. <clears throat> That's 50 meters of air. And one teaspoon of water in one liter of water. Prove it to yourself. Teaspoons, about six grams of sodium chloride, 5.8 grams. Put that in to solution. We've got two moles of ions, one mole of sodium ions, one mole of chloride ions, times 8.2 of 5 times 10 to the minus 5. That's 298 divided by. 
one liter of water. Is that <coughs> oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot that. Yeah. Okay, so we've got 0.1 moles of sodium chloride, but that's one mole of sodium, one mole of chloride. Okay, so that will get you 4.9 atmospheres. Okay, so that's a huge height, and it's not a theoretical value. You can actually do it, and people have. Um, put little tubes up the side of a cliff that's 50 meters and measured the height due to this. Okay, so it's measurable and will actually work in practice. So it's, it's a huge pressure we have to overcome for very, very small amounts of salt. Let's take a look at seawater, which is far greater percentage salt. Its osmotic pressure is 25 atmospheres. Okay, so we've calculated 0.1 mole that equation that we just worked with, we got 4.9. That's, this is, notice they're approximately equal. It's a good approximation for dilute systems. But if we measure it in a lab, the actual osmotic pressure is 4.56. So a little bit smaller, the true osmotic pressure. But seawater, 25.2 atmospheres. Okay, so this is why salt water desalination is so expensive. We have to first get 25.2 atmospheres just to overcome the osmotic pressure and then go beyond it to get any reasonable flow rate of salt. I mean, if you have a pump, I can only drive like 24 kg, I didn't do anything at all. We'll just sit there. Okay, so salt water desalination, no surprises then that this is an expensive separation and uh, we do it only because water is so, so necessary for us, but uh, it comes at tremendous cost. Okay. So reverse osmosis occurs when our pressure we supply exceeds that osmotic pressure. And the net useful driving force is only the difference between what we supply minus the osmotic pressure. Okay. So let's just come back to ultrafiltration. And ultrafiltration, we saw our delta, delta P's we're in the order of 0.1 to 1. Um, when we're dealing with, um, with reverse osmosis, we're now at 20 to 80 atmospheres. Okay, that's huge, huge differences of pressure. Not just in terms of utility cost, but also think of that membrane itself. The structure of that membrane has to be engineered in such a way to withstand such large pressure differences. So it's not, just, it's not just to say this needs to be high, but also recognize that our engineering for that food, that uh, vessel that contains these high pressures <coughs> needs to be engineered to withstand those pressures. The utility costs are going to be substantial. And then we're going to put this through a membrane, pass it through, <coughs> we get our permeate on one side, and I get my retentate here on the other. And to do that, I, I need all that pressure. So the moment I get out here, I've lost, <clears throat> I've lost a lot of that pressure. Okay, so uh, there's a big pressure drop across this unit. But what's coming out here is still pressurized. So a lot of engineering exists on recovering this pressure in this stream leaving and being able to reuse it so that we can minimize our utility costs. So there's some neat, uh, neat patterns on mechanical devices which will do that pressure recovery for you. And uh, I believe I put a, a link to some videos down here on some novel, interesting ways of recovering that delta P. So the next class, we'll look at some of the economics and the modeling of the business.